Hi, this is David Miller, and I'm here with the third in a series of mini lectures on Richard Wright's novel, Native Son. Today we're going to talk about Book Two, Flight. The pattern of the action in Book Two of Native Son continues to show Bigger moving through what Richard Wright calls the no man's land between two worlds. The action unfolds over two days and a night. On the morning after he kills Mary Dalton, Bigger wakes up once again in his family's one-room apartment, but now he and his life are changed forever. On day two, we follow Bigger back to the Dalton's house, the first of six times during this long day that he will go from one world to the other. The first day ends with Bigger repeating the same crime he committed the night before. Now, though, his crime is deliberate. He really does rape Bessie, and her brutal death at his hands is no accident. Ironically, this is not the crime for which he will be hunted down and prosecuted. The quote-unquote rape of Mary Dalton may never have happened, but it becomes more real. It has more powerful effects and consequences in the world than the rape he does commit. The pattern we saw in Book One, in which Bigger fantasizes about the white world and then displaces his anger onto Gus, underlies this contrast in Book Two between the imagined rape of Mary Dalton and the actual rape of Bessie. Before, he took out his fear and anger on his friends. Now, he takes them out on his girlfriend. But for these actions, there are no consequences. Only his crimes against the white world count as real even if they exist only in the inflamed imaginations of a deeply racist public. The first long plot movement takes up most of book two. It takes us through three pairs of scenes, one at the Dalton house, followed each time by one with Bessie. In the final pair of scenes, the discovery of Mary Dalton's bones in the furnace parallels and in a way causes the murder of Bessie. This second murder is followed by another break, like the one we saw in book one. The second and final plot movement is very brief, only 29 pages, and very rapid. Bigger wakes up hungry, cold, and almost penniless in the abandoned building where he killed Bessie. He steals a newspaper and reads about the manhunt. Eight thousand men, many of them vigilantes, have surrounded the Black Belt and are working their way through it, building by building, searching everywhere. Bigger knows he's trapped, and Wright makes certain we remember the rat from the novel's opening scene. He reeled through the streets, his bloodshot eyes looking for a place to hide. He paused at a corner and saw a big black rat leaping over the snow. It shot past him into a doorway where it slid out of sight through a hole. He looked wistfully at that gaping black hole. Bigger hides by breaking into vacant apartments. He buys a loaf of bread and overhears a conversation between two black men arguing about what is happening to residents of the South Side as a thousand homes are raided, windows are smashed. Several hundred Negroes resembling Bigger Thomas are rounded up Several hundred others are fired from their jobs. White parents ask for schools to be closed, and Negro men found in white neighborhoods on the north and west side are beaten. Bigger keeps running and hiding until later that night, the manhunt traps him on the roof of a building. He's captured when the fire department turns water hoses on him, and book two ends as he passes out in the snow to cries of, lynch him and kill that black ape. Across this simple, powerful pattern, Wright develops an equally simple and powerful set of symbols. There is the snow that covers everything, trapping Bigger in an all-white world. There is the white cat, too, perched on his shoulder like a bad conscience, and the ghostly white figure of Mrs. Dalton. Space is another powerful symbol, especially as the dragnet closes in on Bigger and his world gradually shrinks down to the frozen top of a water tower. Today I'd like to focus on one symbolic pattern in particular, decapitation. Like all of the symbols Wright develops in Native Son, this one is anchored 
in the realistic details of the action. Bigger had to cut Mary Dalton's head off her body to fit her into the furnace in the basement of the Dalton home. But it quickly becomes a hallucination as Bigger keeps seeing the severed head. There was only one thing that worried him. He had to get that lingering image of Mary's bloody head lying on those newspapers from before his eyes. He unlatched the gate and went past the car, seeing before his eyes an image of Mary, her bloody neck just inside the furnace, and her head with its curly black hair lying upon the soggy newspapers. He glanced to the left and right to see if anyone was watching, then opened the furnace door and peered in, his eyes filled with the vision of Mary and her bloody throat. There was no sign of the body, even though the body's image hovered before his eyes, between his eyes and the bed of coals burning hotly, like the oblong mound of fresh clay of a newly made grave. The red coals revealed the bent outline of Mary's body. He had the feeling that if he simply touched that red oblong mound with his finger, it would cave in and Mary's body would come into full view, unburnt. The hallucinatory image of Mary's severed head or decapitated body haunts Bigger powerfully, but it is based on the physical details of the scene. The next time we encounter this symbol, it is pure fantasy. As he walked beside her, he felt that there were two Bessies, one a body that he had just had and wanted badly again. The other was in Bessie's face. It asked questions. It bargained and sold the other Bessie to advantage. He wished he could clench his fist and swing his arm and blot out kill, sweep away the Bessie on Bessie's face, and leave the other helpless and yielding before him. This passage obviously foreshadows the murder to come, for it describes exactly what Bigger will do with the brick he finds in an abandoned building later that night. Swing his arm and blot out, kill, sweep away the Bessie on Bessie's face. The sequence is reversed. In this passage, Bigger first erases her face and then imagines enjoying her helpless body, whereas the rape will precede the murder when he acts on these impulses. But the parallel is clear. Later, when Bigger falls asleep in his room at the Dalton house, he dreams of a church bell in the darkness. With each passing moment, he felt an urgent need to run and hide as though the bell were sounding a warning and he stood on a street corner in a red glare of light like that which came from the furnace and he had a big package in his arms so wet and slippery and heavy that he could scarcely hold on to it and he wanted to know what was in the package and he stopped near an alley corner and unwrapped it and the paper fell away and he saw it was his own head his own head lying with black face and half-closed eyes and lips parted with the white teeth showing and hair wet with blood, and the red glare grew brighter, and he was running over a street paved with black coal, and his shoes kicked tiny lumps against tin cans, and he knew that very soon he had to find some place to hide, but there was no place, and in front of him white people were coming to ask about the head, from which the newspapers had fallen. At first, a gruesome reality. The severed head becomes a hallucination, then a fantasy, then a nightmare, as the symbolism passes from Mary to Bessie to Bigger himself. The essential pattern of the action in Book Two is distilled into this progression. The hallucination in which Bigger imagines the coals falling away to reveal Mary's body beneath foreshadows the climax of the three scenes at the Dalton house when a reporter rakes through the ashes and discovers her bones. The fantasy in which he blots out the Bessie who bargains and asks questions foreshadows the brutal climax of the three scenes with Bessie as Bigger repeats his earlier crime in a more vicious form. The nightmare in which Bigger runs and hides while carrying his own severed head, foreshadows his desperate flight and capture at the close of book two. 
Next time, let's continue this discussion of the symbolism of decapitation in the novel by considering further how it applies to bigger.